What's worse than an installer that takes forever, an installer that steals your stuff? And what's worse than advertising, advertising that also tries to steal your stuff? Let's talk about two interesting articles about malicious installers and malicious advertising. Today, we are facing an unprecedented array of data breaches, hacking attempts, and surges in digital crime. Why is there such a widespread amount and how little is noticed in our everyday lives? Malware, dark sites, brute forcing, zero days, script kitties, and nation state hackers are all on the rise. Learn more about the threats we face and gain a bit more knowledge than yesterday. Hey everyone, another episode of Exploit Brokers is coming to you now. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Exploit Brokers. If you're on YouTube, if you could please hit the like, subscribe, and bell notification icon, it'd be a huge favor because we get to reach this out to as many people as possible. And if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please give us a follow or subscribe and give us a good review if you don't mind, uh, so we can help grow the channel there as well. With that said, let's jump into it. So guys, today we're going to be talking about an article by Bleeping Computer. New Steel Fox malware hijacks Windows PCs using vulnerable driver. A new malicious package called Steel Fox mines for cryptocurrency and steals credit card data by using the bring your own vulnerable driver technique to get system privileges on Windows machines. The malware bundle dropper is distributed through forums and torrent trackers as a crack tool that activates legitimate versions of various softwares like Foxit, PDF Editor, JetBrains, and AutoCAD. So to kind of break down what that means, right? The system privilege on a Windows machine is pretty much, think of it like, for those of you who are familiar with Linux, think of it like root. And for those of you who are not familiar with Linux, think of it like an admin or an administrator, right? But more powerful. It's something the system has. Um, I've encountered issues where something gets corrupted and it's controlled by system, right? And even as administrator, it doesn't let you do it doesn't let you remove it or edit it right away that you got to get through this kind of weird uh, workaround to try to remove certain files that get corrupted and are given system only privileges. A crack tool is essentially what you see a lot advertised as a piece of software that lets you bypass the authentic activation of a software, right? So think whenever you buy something, let's say Adobe, let's say Win uh, WinRAR, for those of you who are listening and know about that, that's a little funny inside joke. But, you know, say Adobe, um, in this case, AutoCAD, JetBrains, you know, we could think Maya, whatever software that you're buying. And that software requires some kind of license, right? Same way that Windows requires licenses and stuff like that. A crack tool is anything that allows you to pretty much quote unquote activate. So you're bypassing whatever mechanism that that software is doing to activate itself and forcing it to understand that it's activated. Now, this is done based off what I know, usually through some kind of memory edit or registry edit. Whenever you create a piece of software, if there's some kind of authentication mechanism, you have to store that somewhere, right? You have to store it in memory, in a registry, in a file. And in theory, if the software isn't built in a way that it checks it periodically or regularly, then bypassing it once might be enough to bypass it permanently so that's kind of what a crack tool does there's more nuances than that but that's kind of the rough idea of it going back using a vulnerable driver for privilege escalation is common for state-sponsored threat actors or apts and ransomware groups however the technique now appears to be extended to info stealing malware attacks kaspersky researchers discovered the steel fox campaign in august but say the malware has been around since February 2023 and is increased distribution lately using multiple channels, torrents, blogs, and posts on forums. State-sponsored threat actors or APTs, advanced persistent threat actors, are hackers who are hacking on behalf of a nation state to push some kind of agenda. Ransomware groups are organizations, whether individuals or multiple entities that are an organization, a malicious or criminal organization, whose sole purpose in this case, is to spread ransomware to try to get whoever's affected to give them money. And the Steel Fox campaign has a malware that's been around since February 2023, and they use stuff like blogs, post on forums, think hacking forums, jailbreak forums, uh, crack forums, etc. Torrents, right? If you were around in the 
LimeWire days or the old Napster days, right? You would, you'd always eventually install something by downloading and clicking the quote unquote MP3 that was actually in EXE. Well, in this case, you know, you're finding it, you're finding a lot of things through torrents nowadays, and this is included in them, right? A crack tool that's actually malicious. Now, I will say as a software engineer and as someone who creates software, I would just, if you like something and you really believe in it and you're able to buy it, just buy it, right? Support the developers, support the companies who are building this kind of stuff. You know, JetBrains is a pretty big company. It's not like some individual developer, but they make good stuff, right? AutoCAD too. Granted, I do agree. Some other stuff is a bit overpriced and they could definitely make some stuff cheaper for individuals. But, you know, if you genuinely use a tool in some kind of professional capacity, pay for your stuff. Um, but for those of you who are still going to be using the crack tools, be aware, right? We can, we're going to keep talking about this, but be aware because you get stuff like this and you know, now for trying to bypass stuff, you get pumped and it's probably going to cost you a lot more than the price of that software. So moving on, according to the company, it's products detected and blocked steel Fox attacks 11,000 times. So Kaspersky reports that malicious posts promoting the steel Fox malware dropper come with a complete instructions on how to illegally activate the software. Below is a sample of such providing directions on how to activate JetBrains. The researchers say that while the dropper does have the advertised functionality, users also infect their systems with malware. Since the software targeted for illegal activation is typically installed in the program files, adding the crack requires administrator access, a permission that the malware uses later in the attack. So because it's doing things that require administrator access, you run it as administrator, which means now you're giving this malicious piece of software, the, the crack tool, admin permission, right? Because you have to run it as admin. Kaspersky researchers say that the execution chain looks legitimate until the moment the files are unpacked. They explain that a malicious function is added during the process, which drops on the machine code that loads Steel Fox. Having secured admin rights, Steel Fox creates a service that runs win ring zero dot sys inside a driver vulnerable to cve 2020 14 979 and cve 2021 41 285 which can be exploited to obtain privilege escalation to nt system level so what does that all mean they're installing a driver that's vulnerable to them pretty much being able to hijack it or hack it using the cve mentioned before and by doing that, they're able to do a privilege escalation to a system level. And in simple terms, you are running as user A and through privilege escalation, you're able to now run as system or administrator. And the reason that's important, right, is if you do proper provisioning of your permission levels, right, a lot of stuff should not be running as admin. If you have everything on your computer, everything on a server running as admin or root, you're doing something wrong most likely because you try to give something that's running the least amount of privileges possible because if it gets hacked well it doesn't have full-blown access to everything but here privilege escalation does exactly that it gives whatever is running the highest level because when you have root you pretty much own a system now the wing ringo sys driver is also used for cryptocurrency mining as part of it as part of the XM rig program for mining Monero cryptocurrency. Kaspersky researchers say that the threat actor uses a modified version of the miner executable that connects to a mining pool with hard-coded credentials. Then it establishes a connection with its command and control or C2 server using SSL pinning and TLS v13, which protects the communication from being intercepted. So I actually had to go look this up because some of it I didn't fully understand just based off the article. So I actually went to a different article and I will link that in the description below for any of you who want to get a bit more technical on it but essentially they are using a vulnerable piece of software which is the mining software in this case the XM rig software that's being used to mine Monero and that one has a vulnerability so when you install it the winring 0.sys is a driver that is meant to mine Monero but it's also a driver that's vulnerable to pretty much hijacking and giving access, right? So because you've given administrator access to the crack tool, they're able to install this driver. This driver 
then is going to use your computer to mine uh, Monero, which is a cryptocurrency that's allegedly hard to track. Everything can be tracked with enough resources if the government really wants to find you. But it mines Monero, and from there, it is then running a vulnerable thing which can then get injected. The thing that gets injected then downloads an info stealer, which then steals a bunch of stuff from your computer, specifically your browsers. So it also, and I'm continuing on the article, it also activates the info stealer component that extracts data from 13 web browsers, information about the system, network, and RDB connection, stuff like browser data, cookies, credit cards, location, search history, software, software that's installed, such as antivirus, running services, add-ons, build information, SIM card data available. It steals a lot of stuff, right? And I mean, right off the bat, cookies and credit cards are a gold mine because credit cards, that shouldn't be hard to explain and cookies, right? If they can use a cookie to get into, um, into your different applications, right? Whether that's your banking, your Facebook, other stuff, they can either spread themselves more or find some way to monetize off that. Now, the researchers note that Steel Fox collects uh, from browser data. I, I just touched that, so let me jump on the next one. Kaspersky says that although the C2 domain Steel Fox uses is hard coded, the threat actor manages to hide it by switching its IP addresses and resolving them through Google Public DNS and DNS over HTTPS (DOH). Steel Fox attacks do not have specific targets, but appear to focus on users of AutoCAD, JetBrains, and Foxit PDF editor. Based on Kaspersky's visibility, the malware compromises systems in Brazil, China, Russia, Mexico, UAE, Egypt, Algeria, Vietnam, India, and Sri Lanka. Although Steelfox is fairly new, it is a full-featured primeware bundle, the researchers say. Analysis of the malware indicates that its developer is skilled in C++ programming, and they managed to create formidable malware by integrating external libraries. So a C2 domain is, first off, C2, command and control. Domain is what a piece of malware in this case is going to use to resolve how to talk to its main control server. And what Steel Fox is doing is, although the domain itself is hard coded, they're switching up the IP addresses in the public DNS and DNS over HTTPS so that way it can stay anonymous. Whenever you go to google.com, servers don't understand google.com. Your web browser will essentially make a DNS request. That DNS request then comes back with some kind of IP address, whether that's IPv4, IPv6, and then your system will connect to that. By the malicious actor keeping their IP addresses cycling, it's hard to figure out where exactly they are. Now, they might be cycling by creating instances on different providers, uh, maybe using different computers that are infected to run the C2 software. I don't know, but they're definitely switching it up. Now, the fact that they're attacking compromised systems in Brazil, China, Russia, Mexico, I can understand why they're probably going after the crack software, right? Places like Mexico won't necessarily have the thousands of dollars necessary to buy AutoCAD software. Um, and that could be the same for places like Vietnam, India, Brazil, China, right? Russia, where it's just some of the stuff is expensive, right? Whether you live in the United States, the UK, Asia, um, the countries I listed, South America, doesn't matter. Some of the software is extremely expensive unless you got money to burn or unless you're doing it as a business expense. So a lot of users, I can understand, use cracks. Now, even though all that said, cracks are risky business, no matter what you're doing, right? If you get found, your account could get banned. There could be possible legal repercussions, etc. Right? And again, I'm not a lawyer. Don't do anything legal. Right? I, I'm not going to say anything beyond that. Now, the part that's interesting is this last part. They are a skilled in C++ program. So C++ programming is one of those programming languages that is a very strong programming language, right? If, if you've heard of C, right? C is kind of like the old school, super powerful language. C++ is the newer version of it, but not really. It's not really C. It's just C++, right? It's the upgraded, quote unquote, that takes inspiration from C. But it introduces a lot of things and it still keeps some things like pointers. But C++ is extremely powerful because it's been enhanced for stuff like GUIs and other different libraries that exist for the language. It has a lot of support. But to use C++ is 
much different than something like Python or JavaScript or TypeScript. C++ is a language that is very easy to hurt yourself and others and everything else with. Because C++ gives you a lot of control over hardware and drivers. And if you tell it, hey, go access this piece of memory that I don't have access to, it'll do it and blow up the program. C++ just assumes you know what you're doing for good or bad. So if it's a very well written piece of malware in C++, that probably means the malicious developer is at least somewhat decently skilled. But that's kind of it for this one. Um, the takeaways are essentially try not to use cracks. And if you do, just care for what you're using because you're going to get pwned. On to the next story. Large eBay malvertising campaign leads to scams. This is something from Malwarebyte Labs. And it's kind of interesting because this goes on the completely other side of technical, where the first article is a super technical dive in that's using malicious software, uh, you know, hijacking a driver and all this. This is essentially more on the social engineering side, right? Let's go into it. Tech support scammers are targeting eBay customers in the US via fraudulent Google ads. In a few separate searches, we were able to identify multiple sponsored results that were created from at least four different advertiser accounts. While most of these ads clearly look to fake, they appear consistently and prominently enough to trick the inattentive user into a scam. Victims who clicked the ad were redirected to bogus websites, prompting them to call for assistance, leading them straight into the scammer's den. We have reported the malicious ads to Google and are monitoring for similar campaigns targeting other brands. So kudos to Malwarebytes reporting them and hopefully we can take them down. So when you talk about malicious things like this, right, where it's not installing something, it's pretending to be something that it's not to get the user or the victim to call or click or install something. Here you're kind of using the social engineering aspect of cybersecurity because most of the time a user is generally the weakest link. When you have zero days and all this, that's super cool. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of stuff in the cybersecurity world is generally user trip, whether that's clicking something or doing something, even the most skilled people, the skilled users, right? Think doctors or even IT people, programmers, doesn't matter. If you're not paying attention, you could get pwned by this. And then you have the people who just don't use the computer every day, right? Think people who are retired or people who just don't like computers and aren't used to it, they fall for it. Anyone and everyone can fall for these attacks. The problem is that some of them are very tricky. Some of them are very good. In the article, Flurry of Ads, one of the subheaders, a search for eBay phone number or eBay customer service from the US using Google Chrome returned several ads that were entirely fraudulent. Upon closer inspection, we found that they were created from four separate advertiser accounts some belonging to legitimate entities, some created from scratch. The one that I want to specifically highlight, I thought this was interesting. The first ad shown in the screenshot, and for those of you listening, it's a screenshot that looks like it's coming from www.ebay.com with the eBay logo and everything. It's pretty good outside of some of the colorful text that they're using, right? Um, because they put the word Garmin with an at sign, e.bay. So those are red flags. But if you were to just look at like the little header, it just says eBay.com with the eBay logo. It, it looks kind of convincing. The first ad shown in the screenshot above the most de most deceiving of all, since it uses eBay's brand name, logo and website. While Google has strict rules about who may be allowed to use this or to do this, the owner affiliates, scammers are still able to comply with the rule and yet be total crooks. All they need to do is ensure the final URL, once you click the ad, is on the same domain or is a subdomain that matches the one shown in the ad. That's the case here. They're using developer.ebay.com, part of eBay's developer program search, which can technically be claimed as belonging to eBay. Yet, as you see below, the destination URL is not what one would expect. It shows a search portal with a printed search result that has eBay's customer service phone number, it, it's not um, showing up on it. And essentially what they're doing here is a very, very clever thing. The developer program portal has a way to search. And if you've ever done a search on Google or anything else, you can copy the URL 
And a lot of the times the URL will have the search term in question, right? So say you're searching for exploit brokers, eh, my show, and you go to Google and you do that, then if you were to copy the URL, it's going to do something like google.com forward slash, and then a bunch of stuff. And you can send that to someone. That was very popular with stuff like Google, let me Google that for you and things like that. Well, what they did here was the query itself, what they were searching for was something that looked like eBay.customer-service and then some malicious phone number. I'm not going to say it. I don't want people calling it. Suffice this to say, it's a bad phone number. Because that's a query and you were to click on it, there would be no results shown, but on the screen, it would say eBay.customer service with a phone number, and it would be one of eBay's legitimate websites, developer.ebay.com. And to someone who just says, oh, well, this is eBay because it's eBay.com. It looks authentic, but they're taking advantage of the way that a search functions. And it's kind of interesting because you're taking the ability to give it an authentic domain because it is, and you're using a search thing that eBay has in a way to trick it. And I just found that really interesting. Now the article goes on to say the other ads redirect to fake websites or pages hosted on cloud providers, such as Bitbucket claiming to be eBay customer service. Once again, scammers made it clear and obvious that users should call the phone number displayed on the screen. These are less obvious, right? Cause if you look at the URLs, just one of them is like up bay dot online. That's obviously not eBay, but they do a really good, you know, replica website for what looks like should be authentic eBay. Ultimately, if you're ever in doubt, go to eBay.com, go to the specific website that you know how to get to and look for support that way, because going to Google apparently is not always trustworthy. And if you ever get to any kind of support anywhere and they're telling you to buy, to pretty much pay for your account or do something via any kind of gift card hang up and go find a different phone number that you should never be getting asked to pay for accounts or to do anything with a gift card. It just, it shouldn't happen. But guys, I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for listening to another episode, or if this is the first welcome to the channel and thank you for listening all the way to this point. This has been Exploit Brokers. I will see you in the next one.